I went down a ski hill on an inner tube, landed on my head going 35 miles an hour. My my head went into my chest, ruptured my spine at C6 and C7. I remember them saying, based on what we saw, we could, we think we can fix you. And then I just realized I had tears streaming down the side of my face. And I was like, well, I just, I just have no idea what's going on. I had this beautiful voice, this clear voice that I can only say is the voice of God. The voice just said, you're going to go work with kids and food and you're going to help kids connect to food. That's That was it. And it was, there was no monkey brain, no weird voices. And you're just like pure clarity. I just choose to have a beautiful connection with the divine. And I, I don't even know if I choose it anymore. It just is. I think that there are many ways for people to experience the divine, whether you choose to go to church or whether you choose to whatever religion you're, you're part of, certainly don't do it by breaking your neck. I've learned that part. But the psychological awakening is pretty great. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad to have this conversation with you. I got your book. When we when we met, we had dinner at like an amazing restaurant. Then we got to talk about some various things after dinner. But I mentioned the restaurant because the food was so good. So good. And I find that, you know, you travel outside of the country into these different places. And, and we were in Mexico. Um, but the food can be so amazing. In Mexico City, I believe right now is the best food in the world. It really is extraordinary. And the chefs are at the highest level. I, I think it's because... During COVID, Mexico City became this um, this uh, quarantine stop. So you had to stop there for 14 days. And so it became discovered. And of course, their chefs were always great, but other chefs from around the world have now moved there. And and so now, not just Mexico City, but areas around Mexico have a little bit of offshoots of that. Oh, huh. that's actually probably a pretty good reason. Um, it's like tall people become basketball players and short <laughs> people become race car drivers. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the food was so good. And one of the other things, like we're going to talk plenty about food, um, but uh, the, we talked about your drone company, which I oh, had yeah, just- Oh, yeah, stories. That's incredible. I had just seen your show in Vegas for the last F1 race. And I was like, oh my God, that was you? I'm like, that was like <laughs> the most amazing drone show I've ever seen. As I was describing, like there was like a five, four, three, two, one that like counted down uh, oh, yeah, Lewis right, Hamilton. No, and, no, for, oh, it was so cool. Race car drivers, Lewis and Hamilton and yeah. George were racing the drones. It was incredible. What did I read? It's like 9,000 drones that you purchased for this company. Is that right? Yeah, so it was a, about two years ago, uh, Intel had created this incredible division to build art in the sky using drones. Um, and the because of COVID, there were no audiences. So they like they did the Olympics, for example, and there was no one in the audience, literally zero people. And it it just sort of became this uh, uh, sad, frankly, a little bit depressing business. And um, th they were going to shut it down. Uh, there were a few artists involved. In fact, the artists that did the the, 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 the Formula One show, they, um, they were, some of the folks had reached out to me and said, because I was a big fan of the, of the medium, um, to, would you mind talking to Intel and asking them not to shut it down? Or maybe there's another path they might want to sell it. Or, uh, uh. And so we went through that conversation. And what in that process, I learned that around the world, uh, they're they're building these permanent drone sky stories, these incredible uh, stories, literally like a, like a movie. Um, mm -hmm. They were doing one around Uluru Rock in Australia, that were all promised, of course, not not being done because Intel was just not sure how to run this uh, this entity. And so I said, well, this thing cannot be shut down. We have to we have to do something with this. And so we, um, uh, we we negotiated with them. We got 9,000 drones, literally, like an incredible amount of drones. To imagine all of these flying at once, uh, and we technically can do it. I mean, it, it, uh, it would be a, a uh, if, if it was a movie screen, it would be a movie screen 10 football fields wide. I mean, it's, uh, it's so, the scale is so beyond anyone's imagination. So we just did the NBA All-Star Game, which was incredible. Um, and we're each time we do it, we're pushing the technology to a new to a new place. Well, I think the first time I remember seeing like a true drone show was at Burning Man, not last year, but the year before. And when it started, it was like the man like stood up and his arms went in the air and then he like yeah. fell back and faded out. And then things would just reappear. And I'm like, 
this is so mind blowing. And then the next thing I thought is that this is how they're going to fake an alien invasion. That's right. Well, actually, the, the one of the ones, the, the one you mentioned was was a was a memorial to Larry Harvey, who's the founder of Burning Man, who passed away a few. Was years that ago. you too? That was that was that was that was us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the artist was an artist named uh, Ralph Nada and uh, Studio Drift out of Amsterdam. Incredible mm -hmm. artist. Burning Man, burners through and through. But it was a memorial and it was our technology and it was our engineers that were making that possible. So that was one of them. That's one that you mentioned. And then there was another one, which was actually about talking to aliens. Was that the one with the face? Because I missed that one. That was the was one with the face. Giant face in the sky. And someone took yes. a picture and I had seen it after. And I was like, I cannot believe I missed that. But it looked like it was so close just with the way you're able to create depth with the um, drones. It's a rare thing to experience in person where it is, of course, two-dimensional, like you can play it as a video screen, but then it can yeah. also become deep where you can create a face, like a, like, a, like an actual physical yeah. and that is multiple football fields high. And then the other thing, it, it can actually move around. It, it's not a phys it's not stuck in one place. Oh my God. So it has this physical element to it, like, whoa, are you kidding me? This this thing can move towards me? So it's, a, it's one of the greatest new art mediums, I think, uh, in the world. I I completely agree. It's something so visually new um, for us to see such a new stimulus. Where is that going? Like, I, is it will it continue to be art? Is there another way that it can be used other just other than just for sort of a like entertainment visually? The art it is an art medium, right? Clearly an art medium, but but that doesn't mean you can't use it for well. For example, the NBA All Star Game. You know what we did there was we celebrated a number of uh, like, like LeBron James or Michael Jordan and it's art, but it's also done by the NBA. So, so it's, there's a business element to it because mm -hmm. they, they paid for it. And then, um, and then we're, we're going to do something actually tonight in Aspen, we're mm -hmm. going to do a, uh, a, 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 something that celebrates the history of Aspen. So it's a story, an actual story with, with a, with a voice that tells the story and, and, and some beautiful sound bites from the past that people would recognize that tie into the visual element. Um, in in that case, it, you know, it's sponsored by by a, a sponsor, and there might be some might be some element of a sponsor in there, but it's it's mostly about the experience. It's really a, a, a new, incredible, beautiful experience. I'm I'm a believer in the gathering place. It's kind of why I do restaurants. It's why I do a lot of what I do. Why I do Burning Man. Mm. People, I want to bring people together, and I want them to have a a feeling that a connection that is kind of break, takes them to a vulnerable place. Mm. I think that's one of the things that's missing in our life. We're, we're always trying to be tough, the tough, you know, we're, we're cool. We don't, we're really not to be vulnerable in, in the case of a restaurant where you're breaking bread with your friends, or if you're watching Nova sky stories and you're just, you're, you're, you're just taken to a place of awe. Um, that, 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 that's kind of my goal. I, I want to get people to, to tell them, you know, and uncover a little layer of, their, of the shell that they have around them um, so that they can ex experience things um, a little bit more beautifully. I feel the same. And I have a wine called Somnium, which uh, means dream in Latin. And the whole the whole reason for that company and the vision for it and the reason why I just keep going and keep going, and it's been it's been a long time now, and and it's a it's a it's a long process to profit land, um, is that for me the point is is to build community around it. It's to share it with the people that you love, to make memories with them, to put your phones away, exactly. to get connective. And so, you know, I mean, we're talking about technology, but yet. You know, you've been a huge advocate for farm to table for so long and cooking and, as you mentioned, community community and bringing people together. So, like, it's this fine dance between the technology taking us apart, because as you've heard, as we've all heard for so long now, we're more connected than ever, but we're more disconnected than yeah, ever in right. some ways. So, like, how do we do this dance between technology and the beauty of it and the magic and then the danger of it really keeping us separate? Like, what are the things, what are the com what are the threads that we need to keep us connected in community? You know, it's amazing. It's a great question. I think it's one we're all tackling with. One of the one of the things we do with with our family is so we like to cook morning in the morning or in the in the evening. So seldom, unless it's a weekend, we we seldom do lunch because we're in different places. You know, we'll cook together or we'll kind of have a meal. Kind of, well, someone will cook, but when we sit down, there are no phones. No phones allowed at the table. That's a pretty easy one. Mm -hmm. But the the other thing we 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 ask for is we to put our phones on airplane mode. 
Mm. So they're 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 nearby, but they're not they're not like no one's like thinking to themselves, I'm missing a text or whatever. Mm. It's like this sort of psychological hook that the phones mm. have on you. And there's this mm -hmm. magical feature called airplane mode that that you just um it feels like you've now disconnected from your from your phone. So we do that and our dinners can be five minutes long, but we always start with the gratitude. What are, you, what are you grateful for? And sometimes if everyone are in a rush, it's five, 10 minutes and everyone runs off. But because we don't have that sort of constant um, draw from our phones, we um, we can talk for an hour and a half, you know, and, and these are kids who are ages 11 to 21. They all have stuff to do, but they'll stick around if the conversation's good and they're not also being distracted. And they also, also know that we're not being distracted. Like we... Uh, fr frankly, I think we're worse than our kids when it comes to uh, being hooked to our phones. So turning airplane mode on for my wife and I is so valuable. And our kids really appreciate it. Yeah, so it's actually, you realize it's so easy to judge your kids. And then you, if you just take a moment and see how, how much you are personally addicted to, to your phone, true. it's so true. <laughs> my sister does that too. She has four girls, um, four kids, and she'll catch herself like on her phone too much, especially over the years of like, you know, spending time sitting in a chair and breastfeeding and just kind of sitting there, like having her phone and she, she, her kids will have certain, um, actions or reactions to things she's doing or phones or technology. And she'll check herself and be like, Oh gosh, I have to be really careful how yeah. much I show them I'm doing it. Because as you said, it's so easy to judge them, but like, taking stock and what it is that we're actually doing is a, um, a little more shocking sometimes. Yeah. I love the, the I'm going to make one final pitch for airplane mode because one of the other things it does is if someone wants to check their phone, if they can't just kind of sneak it, right. They, they actually have to turn airplane mode off and wait, and that's a much bigger decision. <laughs> That's true. That's it's almost like it's like the gate in front of the house. It's like you're not going to keep the robber out, but you're going to keep like an honest thief out. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it sure should be simple. I have been taking AG1 for a couple of years now. I take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, which is how they recommend to take it. It has helped me feel the most healthy that I've ever been. That's because AG1 delivers all of the vitamins, minerals, prebiotics, probiotics that I need for my gut health, which is where I feel like I've had the most improvement. My stomach feels flat, not bloated ever. I can accept any food so much easier. I have more energy every day. My skin looks better. There's a million things that I feel like AG1 has helped with to make me my healthiest self. It's just one scoop mixed in water every day, and it makes me feel the healthiest I've ever been. If there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why I partnered with them for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and get five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. Check it out. As I was preparing and learning more about you, I've just learned how how many crazy business ventures you've been involved in, and I'm I I love it, and I love people that are like four minute mile people, people that are invent inventing and creating. So, how did you get that kind of mind that thinks so outside the box that's able to take part in? I mean, one of the companies was about uh, the first time you see like mapping on the internet to... Yeah, that was when I was um, 22 years old. And I was, that was a company I did with my brother. We we were literally the first humans yeah. to, see, to see maps in door-to-door -door directions on the on the internet, specifically door-to-door -door directions. You could see an occasional map that people would post, but this was a, what's called a, a vector-based map, which it, it's built on the fly using actual data that does door-to-door -door directions. And my, my brother and I, you know, you, you, pray, you, 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 you write the code and you press, you press go, and it takes 120 seconds to actually get the results. But when you get them, you just couldn't believe it. You just couldn't believe it. This, this is a thing. This was 1995. So it had been worked on by um, a company called Navtech for Hertz to do the Never Lost Systems. Mm. But Neverlost didn't come out for another five years or something. So they had put hundreds of millions of dollars into, into it and they focused on the Bay Area. 
And um, we had this idea to, to move the yellow pages onto the internet. And we thought it'd be really cool if we could tie maps to it. And then we realized you could get more data than that. And that's where we got the relationship with these guys. And uh, we were these kids. And they, 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 this was great about Silicon Valley. They, they kind of just said, look, we're not here to make a contract with you. We're going to give you all of our data. There's a one page letter that says, if you ever make money on this, you have to call us. But all, we had everything we had, it was so incredible. So we, we were able to write code on their, on their uh, system on top of their, on top of their data and uh, create uh, what we all now know is Google Maps or Yahoo Maps and so forth is, it's essentially the same technology. It's in fact, there isn't any difference and it's now 30 years later and people use it 10 times a day. So I, it's a pretty, pretty awesome sort of early, um, early little uh, stamp on, 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 on the world. Whether, I mean, whether it was that or whether it was the company that like became PayPal or Tesla or drones or whatever, it's just so, I'm so fascinated with how your mind thinks. Yeah, I love the creative um, process and I love working with great teams. Mm. Um, when, I'm, mm. when I find myself in a, in a team environment where I'm like, wow, these people are better than me. Like, I, I mean, I mean, everyone has their gift and I have my own. But when you're around people that are better than you, like really, like wow, I've got to keep up. Yeah. Um, then, then, I, then usually pretty amazing things uh, are are created. Yeah, I've always said that with people like that are just people in my life that are helping me, work for me, work with me, is that I've learned over time that if you don't think someone's quite, you know, you're not really sure if they're right for the job and they're doing okay, you need to fire them because. People, there are exceptional people, and they should blow you away. Do you they agree should, with yeah. that? Yeah. So, so what I what I usually find is people um, have every every person is different, and and they, there's a place for someone where they are extraordinary. And if they're with me and they're not extraordinary, I'm also keeping them from that place. Mm. And so it's a it's a really powerful lesson that it's. No, it's, it's more about are people in the right seat? Are they in a place where their gifts really shine? And um, and um, the, uh, the the lesson for me is if someone is not shining, or 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 there's 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 something missing. They either maybe they don't have, they don't have passion for it, or they um, uh, they might, maybe they're just doing the job because they need the money, and they, they they might prefer to do a job that earns less money, but that's where they would shine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I live in the restaurant world where people in the restaurant world do not make much money, but they love it. Mm. But if you're in the restaurant world and you don't love it, what are you doing here? There's so many other places to go. Um, and so it's a it's a uh, a lesson that it's really applying your gift where where you believe you'll be most appreciated. And for me, when I watch people on my team who are not not able to really shine, um, I don't think it's because of they're just a bad person. No, no, I think they're just in the wrong seat. Yeah. All right, let's move them to this. Let's, let's ask them to leave, which can be a little difficult. But but I have um, I have so many friends of mine that I've built up over the years that used to work for me that I asked them to leave. And now they're in a place where they're shining and they're like, they're just so happy. Mm. We're not actually happy in the position where they were struggling. Totally. Yeah. Um, do you think that there's an environment that a boss or an owner can create that will bring out something different in someone? Perhaps like I heard you say that if you're not taking risks, you're probably not making a difference. And so like that's fine for you, but for the people working for you too, I've heard that, you know, when there's so much rigidity and so much penalty or um, uh, there's punishment for doing something wrong or making mistakes, it kind of um, zaps the creativity and zaps the ability to be able to um, take chances and really see things grow. So given the fact that you've taken so many risks, do you, do, is there an environment that you create where people are 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 able to make mistakes here and there um, without I, I being- I definitely do, but I think that there are actually, I think there are plenty of roles where leaders who don't allow risks and don't allow creativity are, are actually, there are, there are, there is a place for them. And then, you know, for example, the military during peacetime, there really isn't um, a, uh, like when you're in, when you're actually at war, okay, yeah, you need to take risks and you need to uh, get creative, I guess, in, in, a, in a, you know, not a great way, but it is truly needed. But if, but if you're, if you're running the military and you need everyone to have their boots polished and their beds made and, and they, and you're building a culture of, 
of you're constantly ready for 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 war or fighting, but you're but you're but you're actually at peace. Those are the kind of leaders that that would if you if you're that kind of a person, you thrive there. But if you take that exact same person and you put them in charge of a, a startup that is let's let's use uh, Nova Sky Stories that's creating art in the sky with um, I mean beautiful artists that can make your heart sing and and they, they they won't they won't be the right fit for that because they they, they won't understand they, they don't allow themselves to stretch in the creative zone or or um, for them t- taking a risk is not even an option it's it's like it's outside of their everyone can handle a certain amount of risk but, mm-hmm. but this kind of risk is far outside of their their uh, their capacity so so the answer there is they should be more in a place which which is more rigid which 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 benefits from being more rigid um you worked with your brother quite a bit in a couple of different companies what was the difference between you two as leaders and like your strengths your skill sets where were you both where were you strong where you were where you weak each of you and and who has been some of the like some of the best partners that you've had along the way because you guys created some amazing stuff yeah it's great uh so yeah my, so my brother and i've been working together forever and we continue to work together uh, my my strength is more of a people person. My brother is truly, I mean, I don't think this is a arguable. He's the top greatest engineer in the world. He's like the Michael Jordan of of engineering. I mean, he's just truly, truly a, a far heads and shoulders above above others out there. And 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 people who will follow him in that way because he's just so good. Mm-hmm. You know, but, but he can be quite harsh on the t- team around him. So when I work with with him, oftentimes I can help out with that part. Um, but then when I work with him, he helps me on the technical side because I just can't solve these problems. I just don't have it in my skill set. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like the the, um, the ability to do. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of basketball. To you when you watch a, um, a a top basketball player play, you just look, wow! I just can't do that. Yeah, I mean, right. I, <laughs> and I just can't do that. <laughs> and uh, and it's uh, uh, it's it's certain things like that. When I'm with my brother, he's he's truly a a savant when it comes to uh, the engineering um, and even just like pushing the edges, the edges of the laws of physics. I mean, truly, truly that level. And and so I think that the two of us together have in certain companies worked very well together, like Tesla, for example, where there's a, um, it's a large people person problem. It's a large uh, uh, technical problem. And there's a lot for us to work on. Uh, I've been working with them with SpaceX for 20 years. I'll be honest. I'm just along for the ride because that is just, I get to go watch rockets blow up. It's awesome. <laughs> and make it. <laughs> uh, and no, no, we've made many, many, but in the beginning, it was like, whatever. Let's just like, this is so crazy. Let's go. Yeah. See. But it takes people too. And so yeah, like, the, it's, it's the, a wonderful it's, group of people. Always takes a team. Like, I mean, yeah. this is the thing that happens in life. So even if you're doing a solo sport or solo ish sport, it still takes a team to yeah. manage the schedule or manage the travel or manage. There's like, it's it, there's a coaches. I mean, nothing in life is really and, and when done great is team. solo. It is. Uh, yeah, I, I want to make sure it is definitely a team, and it is an incredible, yeah. incredible team. It's just. Uh, that one is definitely pushing the laws of physics. It's, it's yeah, no kidding. My pace, above my pay grade, <laughs> beyond the scope of my. Imagination. <laughs> right. I want. I want to talk about your childhood a little because I'm always fascinated by childhood and shaping people. And you know, to find out that your dad was not the best dad in the world and not the easiest dad. I'd love for you to talk about what that was like, and then also your mom, because on the other side of it, your mom seems like she was wonderful. And you know, just even to like see her, you know, her becoming a supermodel in her 60s is just like such a cool thing. Like she, she, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious about your parents and the way that they, what they taught you by being the way that they were. Yeah. You know, my, my mom is, uh, uh, so her side of the family, uh, so my grandfather, her, her dad was a, a grandmother. They were, uh, they, they were pioneers by the classical sense that they, they mapped Africa during a time they flew in a little plane, uh, single engine plane mapping southern Africa because it was not mapped back then, and you're you're in the most difficult, harsh environments ever. So very much like a kind of like an entrepreneur, but almost to the point of you know we could die on this trip, but but mm-hmm. we're going to do it because it's awesome and we're we're mm-hmm. excited. For it. So we kind of had that kind of um, energy in the family, um, and so my mom, my mom, uh, 
became a, a dietitian. Uh, uh, and of course, she is who she is, and we'll, we'll get to her in a moment. When she when she got married to my father, it was a it was a he's a very difficult human and uh, abusive in in more ways than you can describe. And uh, for her, it was about she just got trapped. You know, in South Africa, divorce was not was not legal. It was run by the apartheid government, very hardcore religious. Uh, and uh, and so there was a year I think in 1979 where they finally made divorce legal. And the day that it was legal, my mom had already prepared all the paperwork secretly. Um, she, we escaped in the middle of the night with us three kids in the back seat. Mm-hmm. She just drove for hours and hours and hours away just to get away from from him because there was just no getting away from him. He's just just very, mm-hmm. uh, very, 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 um, very, very dark human. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I, I also say like what what he I told I learned so much from him. I learned what not to do. Which is, uh, look, I mean, like I there is so much value <laughs> so in that too. There, exactly. We'd be racing and you try different setup changes and it doesn't work. We always said, we know now what not to do. Like you eliminate that do. from your like try list. And yeah. that can absolutely be applied to being a human being. But, you know, there's also healing and finding the peace and the like perspective in it. Um, because by no means anyone should have to deal with probably what you and your brother yeah, was, and sister was, had to deal with and your mom. Very hard and my mom as well. But I'll tell you what's beautiful about my mom is on the other hand, she's taught us what to do, right? Where she she really talks about how wonderful it is for her to have us as her friends as we get older. And I really taken that to heart, you know. So I yeah. cook with my kids now and yeah, breakfast or dinner, and it's not just about the experience, which is, which of course is nice. It was beautiful, wonderful to connect with your kids. It's that I'm investing in my friendship with them that I will have for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And my mom taught me that. Like you're investing in your friendship with your children. Even when they're one years old, you're investing in that friendship. And we have a wonderful friendship with our mom that um, will keep that forever until she, even when she, but you know things move on, um, uh, she'll still be there in our, in our, in spirit. I think that's a perfect, perfect thing to say to lead into more of what led you on this cooking journey in such a deeper way. Because you know, as I understand, you started cooking very young. You were twelve. Um, you ended up going to cooking school. Nine eleven happened, and then you cooked for you know six weeks every day for all the firemen and people that were working the working the site but it was the it was a tubing accident that really like gave you this message because you were almost paralyzed is that correct yeah i was um i had uh, i went down a ski hill on an inner tube and landed on my head going 35 miles an hour my my head went into my chest ruptured my spine at c6 and c7 i was paralyzed but it was a I, I kind of won the lottery, I guess, depending on your perspective in that. I didn't break my neck at, at an angle. And when you break your neck at an angle, it twists the spinal column. And mine was just like straight on. And it's very rare to have that. And so even though I had paralysis, and it was a weird kind of paralysis, it was getting worse. It, and and that, that shouldn't be how paralysis works. It should be just right. like, you're, you're, you're done. And so they, I was in a clinic in, in, in uh, Jackson Hole, not a proper hospital, and so, but they did have an MRI machine and we were able to check and they said, well, they looked at it, I had blood in the spinal column from the, from the rupturing of it and it was causing it to be paralyzed, paralyzed. So I had this feeling of, so it's a horrible terror. I would say horrible. It's, it's really, you're living terror because you are, you are, you don't know what's going on. You, your brain cannot process that you're, oh, wow. it, you just, you just can't, it's just, a, I remember them saying, you know, we can, based on what we saw, we can, we think we can fix you. Rational brain was like, oh, okay, great, they can fix me. And then I just realized I had tears streaming down the side of my face. And I was like, well, I just, I just have no idea what's going on. It's just. So because of the spinal column, that reduces your sort of cognitive function because of that? Or was it just because there was so much going on? Yeah, I was in shock. It was more like I was, couldn't, couldn't figure it out. But the, but then I had this, beautiful voice this clear voice that i can only say is the voice of god and it was beautiful it was you're gonna go work i was a high tech technology company ceo i had the restaurant but i was 
not really focused on it. And um, the voice just said, you're going to go work with kids and food and you're going to help kids connect to food. That's That was it. And it was, there was no monkey brain, no weird voices. And you're just like pure clarity. Huh. It wasn't a flash of light. It was a, uh, they healed me. I had two months of being horizontal. So there was a lot of time and your brain goes a little crazy. But for, for the first two weeks, I still had that beautiful, clear voice. And, uh, and it slowly started to slip away. But it had been long enough where I was able to make some major life decisions to to do that. And so I built a, a nonprofit called Big Green. Right. Now, 14 years uh, in, we service thousands of schools and thousands of homes where we help Americans grow food again. Yeah, it's beautiful. We really believe growing food changes lives. It connects you to, uh, of course, nutrition security, where you, you get quality food in your system and you understand where it comes from. But also it's good for mental health. You get out and you you look after your, it's almost meditative in, in, the, in, the, in the day. And then it gets you out into nature. And it also, sadly, today, it opens your eyes up to the weather volatility created by climate change. Because when you start growing food, you realize how much the weather has changed um mm. it'll, it'll the 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 just your garden unfortunately will get will get damaged or destroyed mm. pretty regularly and and that 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 is a it's a lesson we all need to learn right now I get really into sort of the quantum realm and like what's really happening around us. But you said in spirit, but I thought I heard you say at one point, listening to some interviews that you've done, that you weren't, you're not a spiritual person at all or not a religious. Is that, is you know, that I, true? I feel, I feel very spiritual. But okay. I'm not, okay. I grew up in a, the apartheid system where they used the Christian religion to create an, an unspeakable society and just, for example, no divorce allowed. I, like, no, actually, that's not right, you know, or... It was very, it was very um, reminiscent of 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 sort of strict Islam. You know, it's also I wouldn't want to live in that environment either. So the so I I have a kind of a negative view of of religion as it relates to Christianity. I have a negative yeah. one as it relates to Islam. Like, well, what is there? I'm not Jewish, and they, you know that's kind of hard to get into that one. So I'm not really that. So um, what what choice do I have? So I just choose to have a beautiful connection with the divine, and I don't have a judgment around it. I don't have an evangelical streak around it. I just choose to have it. And I, I don't even know if I choose it anymore. It just is. It's just I it just feel be connected. Spiritually, spirituality is isness. And so is uh, spiritual experiences. And, yeah. you know, and I don't know if this is an area you get into, but psychedelics and just like the experiences that you have in there, they're just, they, you, they become fully embodied. And I think that's what's beautiful about uh, spirituality is that it can, it tends to be very experiential. And so yeah. that experience now becomes an isness because it's embodied, right? Whereas opposed to a book and you read the words and you cognitively think about it, you don't always feel it. And it isn't until you have experiences where you can embody this sort of new reality that there's really, and there's no need to even really say anything because it's it's essentially needed by everyone to have their own experience. And it's just becomes the way you live your life. Yeah, I think that there are many ways for people to experience the divine, and everyone has. There, there are many. I mean, in fact, thousands of years of people. Whether it's whether you choose to go to church or whether you choose to whatever religion you're you're part of, and and and. But to to, to for me personally, I, I had I've had it twice. One was with um, when I when I broke my neck, mm -hmm. and then the other time I, I I did ayahuasca, and I did not in any. I didn't even know what. It really was. I, I was just kind of like, this sounds cool. Let me give it a shot. And it was it was not cool. <laughs> it was very intense. No, that is not. It's not. I mean, you can have cool experiences and you can have disaster experiences. Yeah. That you was, are sick. It was kind of in between. Sad. It was kind of cool and a disaster. But 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 the but the um the you know the experience was truly one where where I where I spoke spoke to God and it was a second time. I was like, oh, I know this voice. I know this. I I had this when I broke my neck, and so it wasn't a surprise to me. It was more of a an old friend. I would call it not recreational, 100%. and very very like about uh, I don't know. I have this phrase like if I ever were to do something like that, I'm I'm gonna go wrestle with the demons. Part of it is you you, you kind of also then let go in that process because you're cause it's a few hours, and then you you get that connection to the divine because you're a lot of these sort of things you're dealing with on on your on the surface all the time is really preventing you from having that connection yeah and if you uh uh if people get a chance to connect in any uh, anyway you can go to a, 
um, I've, I've seen this, I've never done it, but you go to a church where they do singing and they really kind of get you into that altered state. It's, it's, a uh, there are many ways to do it, but the, the, um, certainly don't do it by breaking your neck. I've learned that part. That one is, uh, not recommended, <laughs> but the psychological awakening is pretty great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we can get into that state by breathing, by singing yeah. as you, there are certain ways we can take something to force it, but let's not go all the way to like nearly dying or nearly <laughs> being paralyzed. That, I, that's look, I, just... I tried it. I took one for the team. I can give you the feedback. It's not necessary. <laughs> if you're not taking risks, you're probably not making difference, right? You know? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, I think that's great. I think it's just, I think, you know, when someone speaks to those experiences with your level of credibility and success, I just think that it's, um, I think it's a really positive thing because I think there's a lot of uh, benefits that can come in those spaces and places where you do get sort of beyond yourself and into another place. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Thank Imagine you. when you when you're in your when you're driving and you're racing. I'm, I'm just guessing because I've never been there. There's got to be an altered state in there. That that yeah. Uh, yeah. I do think that you work at a different frequency, a different sort of yeah. call it a dimension, call it a frequency, but. Um, I guess I realized this through doing like I always tell the story that. Um, I took too much Dayquil one morning, and I was not feeling so good, and I felt like drunk. And then I went out there and I felt nothing and I was really fast and it was no problem. And it kind of was this mini glimpse into going, oh, wow, we're not in our le in our normal biological beta operating state when we're doing this. We're in some other state of awareness yeah. that's outside of the normal. And, um, and I do think that happens. And I've always said that the ones that can operate at not only that level, but the next level above um, are the ones that are the most successful. It's the moments when, you know, you're watching sports and you see they're down or a player went out that was really good, or they got a penalty and they have to come back and all of a sudden you see something happen with the player or the team yeah. like that is that next level beyond um which is uh i don't know what that's called but i, mean, I don't know if it's high yeah, gamma you know, like gamma mean, state the, the way the way i would kind of describe like you know i start with wrestling the demons in my altered state whatever my altered mm -hmm. state is mm -hmm. and then it's then it's in a connection to the divine but then actually after that it's like so now what are you going to do with it yeah. and 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 that is actually when truly some of my most beautiful creative thoughts will come, my greatest insights into entrepreneurial oppor entrepreneurial opportunities. Because, um, you know, your brain is all constantly processing things in the background, but that doesn't mean they come to the foreground. Sure. And uh, if, 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 um, if, if, if you really allow yourself to have that connection, and it's vulnerable as well because you're letting, you're letting yourself, uh, well, you're telling yourself that you're not, that you're not in control here. But after that, you you can then say, well, now what have I learned, and maybe I can apply it. And th those are those are the most powerful insights for me. Do you have any stories about where the intuition, the the hit, or the or the idea came from to do certain things outside of the moment that you had that experience with God? Is there um, is there an impetus for it that gets you into that place? Have you ever had a dream tell you something? Um, a serendipitous experience? Like, is there any kind of I anecdotal think for me stories? It's, um, it's, it's like a, I think maybe it's a testosterone thing. I'm, I'm making it up. I don't know if it really is, but it's, it's oftentimes I create a forcing function that makes me do something. Because, uh, like for example, the cookbook, I, I wanted to do a cookbook forever. We had 20 years coming in. Let's celebrate. Let's do the cookbook, the whole thing. But it wasn't until I, put a date down where we have to do it by then. Oh yeah. And then my brain starts to engage, but it mm -hmm. still doesn't engage right away. It engages like a month before we that that date. Like a month is not a long time in a in a in the cookbook world. Yeah. But that's where I'm like I remember having this epiphany of of um and it and it's sort of a, a in my own I, I meditate every day. So in my own sort of uh, altered state, which is a just a meditation, but it's still beautiful. It still gets me where I want to go. I remember saying to myself, you know, I want the photos in this book to feel to feel like the restaurant. And cookbooks don't do that. Cookbooks are, this is make, make the food look beautiful. And yeah, the food is beautiful. But I want to make you feel like you are in the restaurant when you read this book. And I was like, yeah, that's going to be great. 
And so we've created this book that has energy in it, that has a feeling of yeah. being a restaurant. And um, uh, that's an example of where where you, if you don't allow yourself to just calm your your your, your system, uh, give yourself a moment to, uh, in my case, be a, a spiritual connection to the divine, and there's and don't 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 have expectations, just, and then just let it flow from there. What comes from there is 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 some of the most wonderful creative insights that 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 I've ever done. You naturally have the manifestation process down. I went to. Do you know who Joe Dispenza is? No, it's like a spiritual teacher, but he 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 taught this meditation practice to manifest and you think of what you want and then you think of a three to five reasons why and three to five elevated emotions having accomplished it. Yeah. And so when you go into visualizing it and you go into why, but then you go into the reason, the feelings it's in those feelings that you actually like have a true bot physical experience with it. You be, you are in the actual final result of what you want. So from a quantum perspective, you've connected with the future event. Mm. And so what's interesting, what you said about putting down the date, it's like you've connected with the final event. Yeah, like right. You've anchored the finish line already. In the back of your brain, you know, there's a stress building up, but you're not thinking about it when you're about to go into this. It just kind of comes in. Yeah. And it's this dance between like the masculine and feminine, the masculine like sets the date and does the thing yeah. and the feminine like creates, you know, and it's yeah. like, we have the dance in relationships. We have the dance with ourself. Um, and it's figuring out how to, you know, flow with it in the most efficient and successful way. Um, but, uh, but it's, you mentioned something really important in that process, which is letting go of that outcome. Because yeah. when you let go of exactly how you think it should go and when it should happen and everything, the universe lines it up in such a magical way that you could never sometimes. And and you reduce that like clashing energy of wanting something so badly, but also implying the feeling of like, I don't have it. Because every yeah. time you want something really bad, you're also realizing that you don't have it. Yeah. And, um, and so- I mean, You don't want to come from a place of lack when you're in that- because then you're not able to get to to the next where do you learn that um i think i just uh i tried a whole bunch of different ways and that one mm -hmm. way, <laughs> those other ways didn't work <laughs> well, that's it that's totally the magic hey i want to talk more about food now um you were talking about having a garden. And so when I was, um, some of the years when I was living in North Carolina racing NASCAR, I had a garden and it was just the best. And I've tried to create gardens after that. Like I created like this amazing greenhouse in another house. And now I live in Arizona and it's a little challenging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but gardens are just like, you said it, like they're connecting with soil with nature with sunlight with you know it's like meditative it's you know there's something to be said about uh the process of creating what you put on your plate too and i love that with big green you basically like bring that to kids in schools right you teach them about growing and and do they do any do they eat the food too like yeah, how does absolutely. that process the, the work because i think food. everyone should be a farmer exactly they, they grow their food they they learn the wonderful life lesson of if you look after it it thrives and if you don't look after it it dies i mean it's a it's powerful then you're talking about an eight-year-old or nine-year-old and they're like yeah. oh i've got to go out and look after it and then yeah. we also we also work to do things that are uh, exciting for the kids so we'll grow strawberries we'll grow cherry tomatoes we'll we'll grow the kind the of ones that grow fast yeah they grow fast and they taste yeah. good and, and um so it's also it's it's we're you know obviously um working with the with them in a, in a place where they are mm -hmm. we do grow things like uh carrots is as surprising as it sounds i mean kids pull that carrot out of the ground it's it's like a little green sprout and they pull it out and it's this giant carrot it, it's the 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 eye their eyes just pop out they can't believe it it's like a magic trick and they'll eat that carrot with the, the dirt still still on it and that is that I'll, I'll never get tired of that experience. We've now been doing it for 14 years and I'll try to be in a garden with kids every few months and I'll never get tired of that experience of watching them um, harvest. And we'll, we'll, we might do, you know, when you're growing food in a, in a school, you're, you're not, you're not feeding the school. You're, you're, you're giving each student a, a taste of, of what, what's growing yeah. there. 
Yeah, it's beautiful. But um, you get to make them a salad or you make them a pizza. We do a lot of pizza gardens where like we got tomatoes and we, you know, just we, we actually make, uh, except for the dough, of course, we make make pizza um, uh, out of the garden. Uh, we do salsa gardens. Uh, we, we grow cilantro, a little bit of onions, a little jalapenos, and um, and the, the kind of thing kids love, right? And and making it a joy for them, making it something they will just keep for the rest of their lives. You know, really was a it was a message from God to do it, and and it's not a chore. It's just a beautiful thing. It's just beautiful. What about you know? There's so much talk about soil and what we're doing to it, and regenerative farming, and that if we don't take care of it, we're going to have like 60 harvests left in our soil before it doesn't produce anything, produce food in a, in the way that we need. Is that true to your understanding and your experience? And what is your, have you dabbled in regenerative farming in any way? Yeah. So I know actually know a lot about it. I've been working in farming now probably 20 years, in, mm -hmm. the life of the restaurant, because we started out as a farm to table restaurant. We're still yeah. considered one of the leading farm to table restaurants in the country. Love and it. Um, and we, we we love working with local farmers. We love working with great sourcing. Nowadays, because we're in more than one geography, we work uh, focus more on the best farmer, not necessarily they don't have to be 30 miles away. But the the, the process of of regenerative is it's a, it's a really good process. It's, it's you know you're putting animals on the land, you're you're adding cover crops for put, put nitrogen into soil. Um, uh, the um, there, 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 there's this concept of no till where you you don't till up the ground and, and let the carbon out out and and there's few there are a few other techniques in there that, that help rebuild the soil so you can't really argue with it it's a it's a beautiful um thing for for us to move towards what what, what the challenge of course is it doesn't work in the industrial food system where you're growing corn at mass and um you know i, I um I, I don't I haven't, any, I haven't seen any data where we have 60 harvests left or things like that. I doubt that's the case. But what I what I will say is that what's great about regenerative farming is it's teaching the industry, the industrial complex, um, different ways to uh, be a little bit more responsible citizen. And, and then there's also the growth of the regenerative farmers themselves, where we have now almost 30,000 <clears throat> regenerative farmers in America, which is an epic number compared to almost zero uh, 10 years ago. And um, uh, but I wouldn't say zero, a few hundred, because they were all kind of there were a lot of farmers that, that were doing it from a beautiful perspective, but they weren't even called regenerative in those days. But um, th this concept of looking after our soil is just a win win for, for climate, it's a win win for the taste of the food, it's a win win for the nutrients in the food, it's a win win all around. There, there are a lot of ways to to criticize it, like it's is it, it's harder work for the farmer, okay, but it's not like it's easy to farm in other ways either. Um, uh, there, well, I think one of the biggest issues, there's no subsidies for, for re re regenerative farming, but there are lots of subsidies for the other way of farming. That's where the government needs to fix, uh, the, you know, to, um, taking subsidies away is very hard, but to also punish regenerative, that's, that's not okay. Yeah. So, and they're not intentionally punishing it, but by not giving it any subsidies, they, they, they are, um, uh, Kind of a backhanded punishment. I do think there's there's important things that the regenerative movement is doing, and and we do. My my wife and I do work uh, to support that movement. You talked about factory farming, and I sometimes wonder um, whether it's you know f vegetables, fruits, um, grains, and things like that, or or animal meat. How possible it would be to get away from factory farming is it possible to i mean i'm thinking about the cities maybe being the challenge so i'm kind of curious with your very like innovative mind and you know your ability to to see into the future with it is there a way we can get to more local farming like i drive to my parents house and i look on the side and there's a there's like a co-op plot where you can have a couple rows for yourself as like in the community you know is there a way that we can get where it really is local. We get away from big factory farming. We have, you know, the quality is better, but then on top of it, you know, you're, you have that beautiful connection with the earth and growing and things like that. Is that like a true vision for the future that we can actually possibly do? Or is factory farming just generally here to stay with the population? I, think that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in such, such uh, it's not one or the other. I think that, that we should all be uh, growing some food ourselves in some way because it's first of all you get to grow what you love so if you love tomatoes in the summer or for us we have peach peach tree peaches it's just wonderful 
Um, so, and it's not expensive to to do this. This is a uh, something that people at, at uh, we work with folks at at the property level. I mean, and, and they and they love it. They 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 absolutely love growing their own food. But it doesn't. But it's not going to feed you all the way through the year. Like if you use Arizona where you live, the there are going to be some 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 months of the year where you can grow, but you won't be able to grow every all part of the year. So yeah. we have a need for for the industrial system. Um, okay. So I think that the 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 answer is not either or. It's more like yes, we should grow food for ourselves because it's a beautiful thing and it helps us understand food and makes us gives us better nutrition security. It's good for our mental health. Gets us out of the nature. It's a beautiful thing, and then. The lessons that we learn from that, and the lessons we learn from regenerative farming, the lessons we learn from um, other 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 uh, more uh, conscious ways of living, they they are slowly being applied into into um, uh, factory farming. So yeah. something as simple as um, but important as as uh, uh, the the rights the for for people working there, you know, human rights. Um, in, hmm. in, Colorado is a, is a big place with, with factory, factory farming. Okay, we probably don't have a big problem there, but you go to the border of Mexico and um, you see how people are treated. It's it's pretty rough, and they might even be called an organic farm. Or and so, actually, no, we need to start, in, you know, un- helping the 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 industry know the priorities of 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 our country. And not every country is the same, but in America, we 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 our priorities are we do care about people. We do care about. Um, doing the right thing and it's not like they're just going to instantly turn into mary poppins over here but they will but they slowly do start applying these these um, uh better practices whether it's either less gmo or it's uh, less pesticides or it's better uh, uh labor rights uh workers rights um uh all of these things that it's like a it's a slow um that's right. It's like osmosis. It's like it slowly starts to affect the industry. But the industry is a big. It's a big ship. So it takes a long time to turn. Yeah, exactly. And we also we also are uh, in need of them. I mean, you look, again back to Arizona. You you're, you need them. Um, yeah. uh, the the food won't won't arrive if it was all grown in Arizona. You mentioned organic. I always feel like I've you know I try and buy organic as much as possible. But then every now and again you hear that. Organic maybe isn't what it's all cracked up to be, or you know, heard stories about like you know the uh, the meat that you get at the grocery store is organic, but the the grass it eats is nuclear, or you know, things that just don't get said about the process of growing the meat or growing the food that they just you know don't mention, and you know it ends up ending up in food. And I had this uh, heirloom tomato uh, that I just finally threw out, but I swear I had it for three weeks sitting on the counter. I just never ended up eating it but it wasn't bad. And I'm like, that's not right. Like, I don't think (laughs) that thing all red should have been able to sit there for three weeks without rotting two weeks ago. Like, and it was next to other vegetable, other fruits. (laughs) I'm like, this thing ages way faster in that environment. So like, what, what's the real deal with organic? And I'm, I mean, mean, again, I think it's also just not a black and white issue. I think that the, the, it's, it is a good thing to use organic because it's better for the soil. Okay. It does help the soil regenerate in its in in a, in a much better way than than. Um, I mean, there's some really really intensely bad things that the GMO. Not all GMO is bad, but the but most of the GMO that we are aware of is really hard on the soil and 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 um, runoff and it runs into the waters and it it, it creates a lot of you know a, a lot of problems for for our fish population and of course okay. down water. I mean, it's really it's got a lot of issues. So organic is a, is a good thing. I think what one of the one of the um uh I don't know if it's a joke or if it's a commentary on folks who say things like that or you know like that that the meat oh yeah it's organic but they do the nuclear grass whatever. I I, I it's sort of like I constantly feel like folks like that are just moving the goalposts and they have another agenda which is just to move the goalposts. Mm. Like, Actually, if if we if if we if it is organic and it's helping the soil and it tastes good, like okay, like appreciate, the, be grateful for 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 the for the fact that you could get it that that you're supporting that farmer. Is the farmer doing something perfect? Well, I don't know. I mean, there are many many ways to define not perfect. Um, you know, maybe uh, 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 they're. I, I'm making this up. They they don't treat their animals well. Um, 
but but their version of it is just emotional abuse. It's not not any of the other stuff we're talking about. Well, okay, yeah, no one's perfect, but they're but they're but they're trying hard and they're they're doing things that we that are generally in the right direction. We should we should we should be grateful for that, as opposed to constantly move the goalposts and go. No, they're still not good enough, because yeah, because if you do that too much, then you're going to get less and less people kind of working on hmm. making things better because hmm. just, you're not appreciated. They're not encouraged. They're not yeah, encouraged. Yeah. That, yeah. There's um, a lot going on in the world today where where it's uh, you either got to be full on you know X Y Z or you're nothing, and then hmm. then someone is full on X Y Z. Oh no no! What I meant was ABC. It's too much. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm like, come on, guys. <laughs> true. That's true. We are in a very divisive point in time where but we're kind of getting off on it. You know, it's like it's like no no. That, why why are we getting off on it? Like, it's almost it's like we're addicted to the, ourselves. Addicted to the drama or the judgment. Yeah, or exactly. the, trying to make yourself seem better in some ways. One thing that does seem to be the case when it is better. Is I went and spent a couple months in Europe last summer, and okay. I do feel like the food is really there's something a little so different. Good. Okay, good. what I mean? Do you agree with that? Like the yes. whole, you know, what and what? What is it that we can do here that would improve the quality of our food? When you look at labels, or you just look at that, we there Europe doesn't even take our food because it doesn't meet standards. Like yeah. they won't even buy it. So who is it that needs to change? Is, is it federal regulations? Um, like what I don't think is it's so much better. But I think it's more the, in, in, in Europe, they have an amazing respect for the artisan. And an artisan could be the farmer, could be the baker, could be the restaurateur. And, um, you know, you could have a restaurateur. Italy is famous for this. You're in a trattoria. You're maybe the only person there. And you know the, the chef comes out, or the owner is the same person as the chef. It's a woman or a man, and and they're like, "What well, would you like?" And you you might, might pick something, and maybe it's not even a menu, and you'll have one of the best meals of your life. Mm -hmm. And and the chef is just so excited to to have that experience with you. That and that's a beautiful thing that is really respected in Europe. In America, it's all uh, about is this, is it a busy restaurant? Is there a volume? And we kind of move our uh, our their their version of ego is. Creating a beautiful dish for that get for for you or that guest. Um, our version, the ego is, you know, no, you got to you, you got to do something more. And I, I'm not arguing because I love America and I live here and it's my favorite country by far. But if I want to go have a beautiful romantic experience, it, it's hard to beat. Um, just feeling the love of that art, art artisan yeah. in America, we're not starting to see that with bakers. They're they're they really are getting good and. Bakers do not, these are not big businesses because when you start getting into industrial scale, all of the artisanship goes away. You just, yeah. you can't, it has to be removed. But nowadays you can go to, um, in most towns, you go, they're, they're, the baker is back and you can actually experience amazing bread cooked mm -hmm. with love, baked with love. And in uh, in restaurants, it's a, it's a little bit less so because restaurants are, there's such tight margins and they, they really have to be busy. And it's it's a, it's a much more of an operational, uh, intense uh, experience, but the the best restaurants, the chefs are artists. They they care. They put in their heart on their sleeves, and they and they want you to they want you to experience love through that food. Yeah. And we do that. At our restaurants, we we try to do that every night, and we don't always nail it, but we try. And um and and that is it's there's more more of that is coming to, uh, to America, and it's it's slowly happening but it's the kind of thing that could only happen slowly because it's an it's artisans right one at a time right exactly <laughs> this isn't being mass this isn't the uh you can't mass produce factory this farming or factory <laughs> chef. Right. Uh, yeah, right. exactly exactly you gotta find the love that makes me curious about something that i had heard that was developed because it does feel like this is on the other side of it which is where we get into tech again which you had talked about these ways of being able to cook where you can take a chef that's not necessarily a great chef and doesn't know how to prepare the food in the right way from the right sort of roasting, seasoning, charring, steaming level. And there's these automated machines that will do it. Is this is this correct? Well, I mean, in the restaurant world, yes. But but for the home cook. Oh, um, for sure. For the home cook, it's, I think it's actually really 
fun learning those skills. You know, like oh, learning how to char broccoli or char. Right. Like, why would you char things? That, that doesn't make any sense. Actually, it tastes great. So good. You don't want to burn it. There's a difference between charring and burning. All right, oh, well, I've definitely consumed a lot of carcinogens <laughs> yeah. for sure. So, so like this, and then you learn that skill, and all of a sudden, you feel like you just up leveled in cooking, and then right, and you learn how to make a fish skin crispy, and all of a sudden, it's tasty versus something you just want to like make it go away, right. and uh, and you're like, oh wow, I'm up leveled. So I I love the yeah, there are there are there are uh, amazing uh, tools out there that will do this for you, but these are also not these are skills you want to. You want to learn, like um, I'm trying to think of a sports analogy. Doing a, I play basketball, so doing a beautiful layup, it feels good. It, you know, it's really great. And if there was some machine or out there that could say, "Well, we're we're just going to make the layup happen," actually, well, no, no, I, I don't want you to take that away from me. I want, I want to, I want to, I want to have that feeling. I can't believe you didn't make a car analogy for. I want to learn <laughs> how to drive the car, but then the car drives itself. I'm like, well, that part I actually like the car driving itself. <laughs> how did you miss that one, Kimball? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. What do you think about uh, uh, having? A, oh, you're obviously you must love driving. Oh yeah. Would you Would you enjoy a car driving itself? Sometimes. Right. If you're on a road trip or you're driving somewhere and it's boring and you're just like. Yeah, absolutely. Driving from Phoenix to LA and it's 80 yes. mile an hour speed limit and just straight lines forever. It would be nice to not have to like just sit there and always stay so focused, right? You can just and it's also look safer at your because phone if you or turn it on. If, if you're driving, you got to be alert because you could hurt hurt you and your family. Right. But if you if you have something that is autopilot safe during a very boring time, right. that's a total win. Way back, oh, this is probably 10, 15 years ago, I went to Las Vegas and um, did like a little ceremonial sort of media day opening for this first autonomous bus in Vegas. And I did it with Penn and Teller. And anyway, this thing went and crashed that weekend. And um, <laughs> anyway, so it didn't go so good. But since then... Well, that was about 15 years ago. But we oh, yeah, yeah. Tech we, is we way not, better. We're not 100% done yet, but we're not doing that. <laughs> I definitely see cars driving around with the big thing on top around town yeah. and no driver in it. So it's happening. But what I did think was that it's it's so hard to account for the human, the, the human. meaning yeah. you can do stoplights, speed limits, all these things like that can be taken into account. But you don't, you, it's hard to account for the human element where somebody just accidentally walks out in the street at the wrong time, where yeah. someone makes a veer, like they have a heart attack and they swerve the wheel. Like you, I don't know. I'm just thinking of any moment yeah. where something outside of a normal sort of per, normal process happens and humans do it all the time. And so I wondered how possible it would be to have autonomous cars without essentially all being autonomous. Like this is yeah, the autonomous know, zone and this is the non or because the human is so unpredictable. Yeah. What, what you're describing is what we call corner cases. So mm -hmm. it's a, a case where, um, you know, grandma is walking on one side and a little child is running across the, this other side. And, and then, um, I don't know, a leader of the free world is walking on this way. And like, as a human, you can go, well, I don't have, and you have to hit one of them. Like, uh, as a human, you 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 have to choose. That's a terrible analogy, but it is real. It's, like, it's one that people use. But the but the but but other humans won't judge you for your decision. Like it's going to be horrible, whatever happens. But you, you won't be judged. What happens in an accident? A, autonomous mm -hmm. cars, you you it, it would be judged. And so so what we do at at Tesla is we we are we're we're much more cautious than we we have to be. Because we really don't want to be in that situation in the first place, right? And so, um, and I think that'll obviously it's getting better all the time. But but as a result, when you're on the on the highway and and that, those kind of corner cases don't happen very often, um, you you it's wonderful to let the car drive itself. And then when you're driving, uh, when I personally drive downtown Boulder, I, I'll get a kick out of it. I'll have it drive myself to work and stuff. But I also like to hold the wheel because it's sometimes it's just too cautious. You know, and and um, You're like come on, yeah, like come on, get over, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. It feels like a, uh, I don't know. You're, uh, you're uh, my my mom barely drives, but you know, it's like your mother's driving. <laughs> I was gonna say driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> yeah, right. But Daisy's driving. <laughs> right, but but very cautious. It's meant to be safe, and it is safe. It's the safest way to go. 
um, and it, it's getting getting better. But I, I, I love your view. You, you know, you, 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 you're a, you're a, you're a driver. I mean, you 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 want to you want to feel it. And I, I I I like driving too. But it's 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 cur- I love hearing your view. What does it look like in the future? Like, what is living as a living human being in your house and you're going to work and you know just having your everyday life? What does that look like in fifty years? How are we going to eat? How are we going to get around? Like, how does that look in the future in your mind? You know, it's, it's a subject that people are talking about a lot today. And um, I, I have a different view uh, of a lot of others is that I, I'm not sure things are going to be that fundamentally different. And and I I, I love this movie called L.A. Story. It's, it's a movie from 1992. Mm-hmm. And it's a movie about living in L.A. And this is before the Internet, or at least before the Internet became a, a public tool, um, before uh, before cell phones, even I don't think there were cell phones in this movie. But obviously, no iPhones, and it is remarkable how identical it is to life today. I need to watch. Like, not like kind of the same. It's identical. Oh my god! So I think that the, there's a um, there are benefits we we're going to get from technology that will enable us to maybe be be more productive. It might it, it, there'll be benefits that will make us safer, like our cars will be safer. Um, there'll be benefits uh, uh, from AI that will help us be be more creative. Uh, um, I, I'm still an absolute believer in the, in the in the power of the person, the individual. So even though AI might be able to create beautiful art, the artist is the one that will guide the AI and will have a story to tell that is de- that they want to move people with. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you think the AI is going to do that, um, I think you don't understand how art works. You know, someone's got to have their heart, heart on their sleeve. So I think that there's a absolutely benefits we've gotten. Let's just let's go back on the past thirty years. We have Google. We can access information in an instant. We have iPhones. We can stay connected with our friends and family in an instant. We are using social media to, to share what we do and 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 so forth. And our lives are the same. And I find I find that both um, it's the right word. It's it's both an optimistic view. It's also like a it's a calming view. Like uh, we don't have to freak out about it. Um, I do I do believe we'll we'll be we'll be healthier as we learn more about the the human the human biology and how how we'll be able to uh, maybe live a healthier longer life. And I think that that I look forward to that. Uh, I think that uh, we also want to have deep connections with our family and friends. And I think, I think especially COVID where, which is really uh, came out of nowhere. We we really saw what it was like to live in a basement wrapped in cotton wool and not seeing our friends playing video games and watching Netflix all day. Drove us all to drink. Oh, seriously. I mean, I mean, I actually, funny you said, I, I never realized I could be an alcoholic until <laughs> because you're sitting around all day. You got nothing. Because it's else. like four o'clock, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. the sun might it's, be going down. I'm going to start now. And uh, say. <laughs> anyway, and I, and you know, for me, I really love the gathering place. I love bringing people together. So it was torture for me. But I know I watched how we had out of coming out of that. We have this kind of loneliness epidemic where people haven't learned how to reconnect with their friends. They're 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 addicted in a negative way to social media. And so I, this cookbook is very much about cooking for your community. In fact, the title is called Cooking for Your Community, Getting Back Together with Your Friends, Building That Relationship Again. Um, yes, thank you. And um, it is a, a celebration of the gathering place. And, and I think that if we, if, we, uh, if we aren't careful, we could go down a path of, of being alone, more alone over time. And I, I hope not. But I believe with enough uh, energy now realizing how bad things were at COVID when we were truly in a technology world, we were, everything was Zoom or everything was social media or everything was email and, and whoa, 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 that, that, that sucked. So I, I, I'm, this book, this book is part of helping us get on a better path. And um, I believe that we will be on that better path. Part of it because we also, we tried the other way and was, whoa, that sucked. Yeah, we got that dramatic, very yeah. quick, aggressive glimpse into what it would be like <laughs> aggressive to just be inside glimpse and, people. you know, some, that's a weird future that we, the dystopian future that we don't want to live in. A hundred percent. Well, maybe, maybe food will be the thing that keeps us 
grounded, literally. Yeah, I, I, I love food is, a gift. We, food is a gift we give ourselves three times a day. Yeah, Make it a good one. Let's do it with our friends and our family. Yeah. Let's yeah. build relationships with it. Uh, we don't have a choice. We got to eat. So it's like, I love let's, that. let's use it. The kitchen, it's a restaurant. How many restaurants do you have? We have three. We have in Boulder, Denver, and Chicago, and we're opening up in Austin this summer. And what about Scottsdale? Are you coming here? Too? Scottsdale might be next. I love it. I will be a huge fan and I will be there all the time. So awesome. thank you so much. This has uh, been very interesting and you're a fascinating person with a lot of heart. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it being on. Uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.